There you go. Okay. Well, welcome to the August twentieth, two thousand twenty-four session of uh, Hamsai and Tapper technical session. My name is Dave KV0S, and uh, this week. I've been cleaning up radios and cleaning up the ham shack and installing a few new things, but um, it's basically catching up with maintenance of uh, everything around here for that I have put off for quite a while. So next on the list is Nathaniel, W2NAF. Go ahead, Nathaniel. Uh, thanks, Dave. I'm continuing to keep my focus on these uh, paper revisions, which are coming along very nicely, but there are always more squirrely details than we would like to have, but uh, hopefully, you know, they are moving in the right direction. So um, a one fun ham radio thing uh, today, I had um, some of the leadership, including the president of the FRC, come visit the University of Scranton today. I got to show them the new station, and uh, we talked about some things we could do with the um, personal space weather station and so we're we're dreaming up some additional ideas with that. Uh, but otherwise, I'm just very focused on trying to keep all the projects going that I have going right now and get this uh, paper uh, through. So back to Nat. Okay. Next on the list is Dave, KD0, EAG. Go ahead, Dave. Oh, not a lot of excitement here. I um, have been most recently trying to make some modifications to uh, the um, KA9Q web interface so it stores, you know, like your settings between sessions and things like that. Uh, nothing nothing very exciting, but convenience stuff and um, also getting kind of familiar with the gritty details. So, um, but that's about it for me. Thanks. Okay, next on the list is Jim, K4BSE. Go ahead, Jim. Oh, good evening, all. <clears throat> well, a couple of things here. I um, I have acquired a, um, some solar cells and some uh, and a, um, a solar battery charger. Go with the Bioeno battery I got some time ago. So I can do a little bit of uh, solar investigations and understanding what goes on in that area now and uh i have uh i played with that uh over the weekend and uh, seems to be working fairly well one thing i was a little bit uh, disappointed in the charger i have has a uh, load port on it that i can connect to the radio but every time i connect the radio to it and turn the radio on the uh charger kicks off overload and uh, it appears that it's just that when i turn the battery on and when i turn the radio on the um uh rig puts enough uh, capacitance across the line that in charge trying to charge that capacitance the uh um power supply kicks off and i try to just putting a um single hundred a thousand microfarad electrolytic across the uh, output and that, that kicks it off. 100 mics does not kick it off. 1,000 does kick it off. And that, that seems to me, uh, be a little bit too touchy on that. Other than that, I have been reading uh, the book Nathaniel contributed to here to there, Radio Wave Propagation. Very good book. Lots of information uh, crammed into there. Back to net, K4BSE. Very good. Next on the list is Scott Newell in 5TNL and no mic, so we'll go on. Next on the list is Dave H, W6OQ. Go ahead, Dave. Okay, um, here in Los Angeles, sun is still out for a little bit. Um, I'm just here to, you know, catch up on what's happening. Okay, and next on the list is Dave Julian, WB9YIG. Go ahead. 
Good evening, folks. No, I'm just uh, trying to wade through about a dozen Astron power supplies, get them resurrected, and uh, beating my head against the wall on those. But that's all. Back to that. Oh, okay. And next on the list is another Dave. Dave New, WB, W8 SBE. Go ahead. <clears throat> it's um, November 8th. Uh, oh, Super sorry. Bowl. Yeah, that's all right. I keep doing that. I'm sorry. And I have to uh, give a shout out to Jim, who has the same suffix, only just in a uh, different order, BSE. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. So we have a lot of Daves and we have a lot of uh, SBE prefix suffixes, I guess. Yes. Um, nothing uh, great going on here. Uh, we're still uh, uh, having our neighborhood repaved today. Everything smelled of asphalt. <laughs> <Ooh>. <laughs> And they're going to continue that on through the next couple of days. So uh, I guess we'll get to do that. I was nice weather today. So we had the windows and the doors open. So all the asphalt came in through all, of, all the windows. <laughs> uh, but that's it. Back to that. Okay. Well, uh, next on the list, we had uh, Clint K7EOI come in. Any comments, Clint? Are you there? think he's still getting settled uh next on the list is dave mcgaw in one hac go ahead uh good evening everyone uh, we're having some interesting weather situations over here yesterday was uh uh smoke uh actually the last several days was smoke coming down from quebec wildfires and for the first time i found myself wheezing from it not Ooh. good just how thick it is today we've getting cleared through but that involves thunderstorms um we're continuing to um, build out our am doppler system um and uh getting a few more receivers out there and um one well first there you know we had a geomagnetic storm uh was it yesterday um but yeah. it was of course during the day of course so we couldn't see anything um but man there's some big spots on the sun i was watching it naked eye at sunset um the other day um and then uh Propagation has changed significantly in that 25 megahertz WWV was bombing in this morning, then faded out. It's S9 right now. So yeah. this is very unusual for uh, for this period, um, you know, since the May 10th uh, storm. Uh, it just has not been coming in reliably. Very interesting effects on the ionosphere. So I think that's about it. I'm picking away. Oh, I know. I'm picking away at various things having to do with the receiver project, um, and one of which is uh, working on a reference um, signal source. Um, interesting aspect of that is that uh, it's easy to make one that's got um, powers of or, or multiples of three, but uh, getting a multiples of two in other words even harmonics is an interesting uh problem but that's where our ham bands are but uh either way um it looks like it's going to be very easy to at least characterize um crystal oscillators um for use as uh, some form of comb uh signal source so that we can give people something of known strength uh to test our receivers with so back to net very good uh next on the list is jay schwartz wb8 sbi go ahead jay uh, good evening everybody not a whole heck of a lot here uh uh going on at least amateur radio wise uh nathaniel i do have a question for you and uh and i got to apologize for this last week uh, I joined rather late, and I just heard uh, something about your 
going to send a group to Svalbard Island in the North Atlantic. Did I hear that correctly? Or no, it's the station up there. Uh, I think I said Hillman is up in Hillman was up in Svalbard last week or something. Ah, I, and, I thought, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so Hillman's up in Svalbard. Um, we, uh, I know that Rob Robinette and his team, uh, we just sent a uh, RX triple eight up to Elsmer Island, which is not Svalbard; it's Canada, but that's up in the Arctic. And I also said that our Antarctic proposal is being recommended for funding, so we're going to have a chance to put um, receivers down in Antarctica. Ah, okay. but that's going to be in a couple of years. Ah, okay. Uh, then thanks for clarifying that. Sure. So, okay. Other than that, uh, nothing real exciting amateur radio wise going on here. So, uh, uh, hope everybody is staying safe. And we'll catch you all later down the log. Back to net. Okay. Now, uh, Bob in 5 brg did I skip you? No, I got here late, but uh, I don't have anything earth-shaking to report. Just wanted to check in and listen to what's going on. Thank okay. You. Uh, next on the list is... Uh, Joe, W7LUX. Go ahead, Joe. Thank you, Dave, and good evening, everyone. We're still troubled by occasional power outages here, which tends to uh, upset at least the the grape DRF. The other one's actually on a very short uh, time um, UPS, but it's being a problem. The uh, the graphs are have some strange kinks in them. And I just wonder, is anybody looking at these, uh, looking at this data? The, um, uh, it's been most unusual a few days uh, here recently, and actually for the last uh, quite some time, probably tied into uh, solar maximum. Anyway, that's pretty much what's happening here. Very good. Uh, Nathaniel, do you have any comment? Um, with the, so... My comment with the uh, grape data is the Rachel Bodeker is the student who's uh, looking at the grape data and she's focused mostly on the eclipse right now. So we don't have anyone, we don't have any funded person paying attention to uh, what's happening with um, storms and kind of things besides the eclipse at the moment. Um, the that's not to say that it won't happen. It's just we don't have anyone funded to work on it right now. Um, I think one of the challenges uh, with citizen science, and we can probably go into this more, is that, um, you know, there's there's a lot of things to look at with this project, and it takes a lot longer to get papers to publication than you'd really like. It's it's really an extremely challenging process. Um, so uh, I would we're trying to figure out ways like if you join in on either the Thursday morning telecon or the Thursday afternoon telecon, you know, we're trying to figure out ways to kind of uh, crowdsource some of the uh, writing process or encourage additional people to look at these extra things. And we'll be happy to provide as much help as we can. Thank you, Nathaniel. You're welcome. Okay. Next on the list is Michael Howen, AC zero G. Go ahead, Michael. Good, good evening, everybody. Uh, I've mostly been working this week just uh, following some of Clint's guidance on uh, tracking back from my radios to my antenna and making sure that I'm chasing down extraneous uh, sources of noise. Um, I've replaced some cables and things, but I have to say that there's still a lot of noise. <laughs> It's always uh, it's a perennial. It must be like death and taxes or something. But anyway, uh, back to net. Okay. Well, I know you've given me some helpful hints over this week, so I appreciate it, Michael. Uh, next on the list is Phil, K-A-9-Q. Go ahead, Phil. Hi, guys. I'm only going to be here for a short time because I want to go to the microwave meeting. I haven't been there in many months. Um one little tidbit we found out today um, 
thanks to uh, Jim Lill, um, what's this called, WB2, so I mean, he was a uh, heavy user, KNIQ radio and ARS triple eight. He finally did a calibration um, uh, to see, you know, what power level going in matches what signal level in KNIQ radio. And the answer is, um, let's see, let me go to my source code here. Um, 43. I have 42, no, no. Um, it says 1.4 dB off from being almost exactly matched. Uh, yeah, one, four, okay, so nine, a minus 90 dBm input signal gives a minus 91.4 dBfs reading and is independent of the gain attenuation given how I do it. So I'm putting in a factor right now, a configuration file factor with default to minus 1.4. So that uh, and and the the control outputs will now appear as dBm rather than just dB. So that's that's a little tidbit I thought might be useful. It seems actually very. He said it was very consistent across units. So that's good to know. Obviously, it's not going to be what's at your antenna because uh, you're going to have feed line loss and filter loss and connector loss and stuff like that. So anyway, that's about it. I got to run soon. Okay. Well, glad you're here. Uh, next on the list is Roy, uh, N0RG. Roy, are you there? Yeah, um, I'm here comments? just uh, checking in finally, uh, been out for a long time. So just listen to what's going on and try to catch up a little bit. Go back to net. Okay, well, glad you're here. Uh, next on the list is Tom in 5EG. Go ahead, Tom. Okay, good evening, Dave, everyone in the group. Not much on the project the last week or two. Moving in two weeks, so there's a lot of things going on. Hopefully it won't be uh, off the conference call for, for long. Back to the group. Okay. Well, good luck with that, Tom. And then we have Rob, Robinette. Uh, go ahead. Oh, he's yeah, got to unmute. Um, well, uh, Phil didn't mention it, but he he did uh, a lot of work to implement uh, front end gain AGC in uh, K9Q with the RX triple eight. Um, as I think you all know, on the triple eight, there's a variable gain amplifier ahead of the analog to digital converter, and um, Previously, uh, that gain was a fixed setting. Um, the AGC that Phil has and still has uh, applied to the decoding gain, which is uh, you know the gain going from the demodulated signal and uh, how much gain applied when you translate that and put it into the wave file or the output PCM stream. So um, adding, having Phil add that. Uh, Front end, as he describes it, front end VGA gain uh, has un opened a whole amazing new view for me into how uh, the Whisper Demon sites, all the triple eight sites are working. And boy, it looks like a lot of them are gain starved uh, badly, at least by 10 dB. Mm -hmm. um, and so that means that uh, we're if my understanding is correct, and of course, if you have an LNA and appropriately structure the gain and so on, it's possible. It seems possible that uh, many sites could be um, could receive uh, more spots, decode more spots than they are. So I'm. Uh, I've been, uh, in addition to that, I've. Uh, I'm in the process of incorporating uh, fixed gain into the decoding AGC for the decoding part of it. So together. We'll be able to uh, make sure that uh, the ADC isn't uh, analog dig digital converter isn't being overloaded, and that uh, we're uh, exploiting the full uh, dynamic range of the 16-bit wave files that uh, on the output. So um, that's that's a really significant uh, effort, and I think may res may allow uh, many sites to Im improve the sensitivity and uh, for us to gain many more spots than we've been getting. Mm -hmm. And basically see signals that we haven't been seeing, even if you're not in the whisper band. Um, it, I'm curious, Rob, Do you, is there any sort of consistency in the types of antennas that these systems are using? No. <laughs> Everybody <laughs> has a di diff different antennas. Um, 
We um, probably we probably really should have a good discussion about <laughs> antennas. Um because for a long time we really kind of have gone with this, oh whatever you put up is good, but maybe we can standardize on this. <laughs> Well, I, you know, Glenn Elmore has designed a uh, active amp, uh, active antenna system, and has made it available. is is an open source hardware project, um, mm. and uh, that's a that's a a practical antenna for many installations because it doesn't require a big a big a big long antenna. You can yeah. put up a a two meter high vertical dipole and do extremely well. So that would be, uh, I think, but but every site's different and people's, you know, their, their constraints, physical constraints differ, um, uh, you know, depending upon, you know, if you're up at, at Elsmore Island, you need something that can withstand the weather. That's the primary yeah. goal. So every, it's all, it's all different, but I, I do think that antennas are, you know, the antenna and the whole receive system is extremely important. I think un- unrecognized i think that many people do not understand how how much their uh, uh their ability to receive signals is impaired by their uh impairments and and problems in in the antenna and feed line systems mm -hmm. and and the grounding and the ground loops and such so um this Bob is Glenn's uh, work on his site he yes he has an op open uh, source hardware uh uh, I can. I'll post up a link to his. Right. Uh, but he uh, has the uh, antenna preamp there. He has he has several antenna preamp. Oh, designs. okay. Okay, that depends upon so what both you high want to achieve. Uh, it depends on what you want to achieve. You know, he okay. has a, a hybrid design where you you know the better optimized. You uh, an active antenna, an active dipole is not uh, uh, a short short active dipole. Uh, cannot achieve uh, get you sensitivity down into the uh, ITU noise floor above 10 megahertz. So you know, and those and those bands, he has a uh, for those bands. If you if you have a site where you where you know you're not limited by local uh, RFI, and there you know where you you can potentially see the uh, uh, the ionospheric noise floor. Um, then you need need a different kind of antenna. So it's a uh, it's 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 a it's not a simple and, and complex you know it's a complex problem. And and I'm not the expert here. I think Plant is much more better informed on this subject than I. So I don't want to um, I don't want to pretend to be the expert. I'm just what I'm trying to point out. I think is that we're getting more and more tools so that you can better understand uh, your environment and see if you can improve it. The uh, Between the controls, uh, a display of noise levels and, and gains and such, and the K9Q web page, for all its its crudeness, is a trem tremendously good tool that uh, people, users should use in order to better understand the R uh, their uh, their receive antenna environment and to optimize it. One of our uh, collaborators has made you know twenty dB improvement in uh, in his background noise level, you know by by studying the and and with I think some of Clint's help uh, led him to find he had a broken uh, shield and a, you know old barrel connectors you know various things can produce problems and uh, uh, I think it. I'm not the person to guide one through that whole uh, diagnostic process, but I, I think there's tremendous opportunities for many people who think, oh, it's all due to the little wall warts around me and all the houses around me. That may be the case, but it's but but one should study the whole environment first and uh, go through a diagnostic process to make sure that you really are, your antenna is really what you think it is, if nothing else. It. Uh, you know, they're, they're, they're sh the shields and the uh, cables in your uh, in your your shack and the wiring of your house may be very well be, be a significant part of your antenna. And um, I think uh, it, we have, I think, much better tools to, to, to give people insights into that. I think we need a whole uh, tutorial there. I mean, it's a multi-day session, I think, to really... Uh, uh, communicate 
the process. And I think I'm not the person to lead that. I think Clint is, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to nominate Clint as, uh, uh, and, and, you know, receive site optimizer in chief uh, for me. Anyway, that's, that's my, that's my focus right now is, anyway, out at KPH, for I example, did. I thought I had a really powerful, I thought, you know, I've got 10 plus dB of gain between that TCA 530, you know, monster antenna and, and the, and the triple eight, it's 10 plus dB gain starved. I didn't, I didn't realize that at all. It's, it's, you know, it, uh, the, uh, uh, Phil's uh, VGA just cranked up the front end gain to all the way to plus 34 dB. Didn't improve the signal noise ratio, but it points out that um, that uh, th that there's plenty of headroom there. If you if I turn it, you know that uh, it needs uh, even more uh, LNA gain ahead of the triple eight. Seen the same thing at KFS. Seen, I mean, I've, almost every place I look, there's. I got you know a, a beverage here with a, a twenty three dB gain antenna. It's it's running at thirty four dB gain on the LNA, and it still isn't overloading. It's uh, amazing to see it happen. So anyway, back to that. I've, I've taken oh. more than my share of fair share of time. Well, we're open for general discussion. Has Clint had a chance? Clint had, oh, Clint was out when I called on yeah, him, but yeah. Clint, you want to chime in here? Mm, I don't have too much to add. I was just looking at the uh, source code that Phil posted with regard to the AGC, and um, I, I, I'm hoping that some of the default values he has said in there can be overwritten in, in the config file because they don't look all that great. But uh, uh, wait, which ones? I mean, I, I you know, it's a, a bunch of. I don't know if Phil's still with us, but he, there's a bunch of of, of constants in these RX triple eight dot C file, and getting that making those configurable is, um, uh, I think, a, a a bit of work for him. So I I suggest that based upon what I saw at KPH and just a couple of other sites, suggest that those threshold values. Um. Okay. um well, the, uh, we, this would be we could take this off the discussion, but it, it, it I, I, knowing what I know about it, um, some of them aren't great, but uh, uh, like the AGC upper limit of negative ten dBFS, statistically you are badly overloading by that. Yeah, I, well, interestingly, not yes, in in theory you are, but uh, but yes, I think that that's one that I, I think it should be reduced by a few dB. I, I think the target goal was fifteen dB FS, and I think that that that's probably it. So I might might move those values down by five dB or something and get well, in the yeah, yeah, neg sixteen and neg twenty is fine. I mean, I mean, you give it a window so it isn't always walking. But uh, yeah. it doesn't. I don't see them walking. Surprise! It, it, I, I don't see the numbers walking much. I, I see them wa walking. This is gain. You know, the AGC adjusting the gain. Uh, I don't see the the gain being adjusted all that much in normal operation. What I see, and I'm trying to. I'm going to. One of the things to do is log this. Is to have a log every two minutes. Of what what uh, to see what he set the gain at. And I think that the, I, I I'm almost certain what you'll see is around four a.m. At local time, it'll start. Uh, the, the, it'll start to uh, lower the gain. Well, right. I mean, you won't see it walking because there's a 10 dB window, which effectively makes it hysteresis. And since you're taking uh, pa over the whole bandwidth, the average power level is not going to change much unless there's lightning or local short pulses or something like that that come and go. Yeah. But anyway, yeah. Um, also. It'd be. I mean, I don't think you've put this on at Utah yet. You mentioned it being gain starved. Um, I don't know if you had a chance to log what the gain AGC is doing over time because well, that's what I'm doing. That's that's exactly where I'm working. I'm working okay. on on. Certain, 
I'll bet you there are certain times a day where it isn't gain starved at all because you, you did note that you were seeing overloads, frequent overloads during those peak times at KFS. And it, also, the other thing I would it would be good to have is there's no, absolutely no point in setting the gain higher than 25 dB on the 888, really. I mean, but with I, the ADP, it's not really hurting you too much. The, the only reason to, to allow it to go up, I think, is to sh is give an indication of how how gain starved the whole system is. Right, right. Okay, it doesn't. I don't think it hurts anything to let the gain go oh, up. No, I no, know. That, I know that it doesn't improve the signal noise ratio, but but it does give for once gives us a way a place to look, especially if it gets logged. Okay, in a log file, to take a look and see what the what the, the signals look like over twenty four hours or or a week or a month, whatever. Uh, to to see what uh, the kind of uh, overall uh, you know zero to thirty megahertz uh, signal levels are over a long longer period of time because I think many of us go look at our our radios in the afternoon and think oh well, geez the band's open and this is you know this is uh, okay I've got you know S nine or whatever you want to call it I you know yeah I, so my gain's fine you know and you know the the worst case that I see everywhere, the ever you know, in the right, and I could we are, already can see that is you look around at a at the uh, uh, Gwen Griffiths uh, noise charts, and you can see there's huge overloads. It includes background noise level and overload counts, and the overload counts uh, happen in most cases every day about four to six or seven a.m. in the morning on the West Coast. Maybe different at other, you know, different different geographic locations probably will have a different uh, time of day when the overloads occur. But here on the West Coast, it's regular every day at four to six. So whatever is coming in, Radio Havana, you know, I don't know what it is. It's you know the uh, that's that's uh, the signals there. Something really opens up early in the every almost every morning, and um, and if if you have a fixed gain on the input. Then during those periods, your, you know, your your sensitivity is dramatically impaired because a lot of your samples are full full overload samples. So you you know basically effectively you have a reduced your your sensitivity because those samples look like noise distributed across the whole band. So. Right. Anyway, I I, I yeah I I I don't think if, I don't think any of us has settled on. On values, I think that I don't. I didn't want to ask Phil to do any more work on this until we had some experience with you know, and and having him, you know, add configurability into the uh, front end gain uh, seemed to me to be uh, may, maybe uh, maybe unnecessary. So we can. It's easy to experiment. You can go in and change the values and compile it, and I, I will. I will do that at. Uh, at KFS and make some experiments and before before I ask Phil to do more work on on this. An example of what uh, Rob was mentioning about having trouble with antennas and feed lines and everything. Yesterday I had a UHF to BNC adapter that came just a little bit loose at the the uh, UHF side. Boy, did that cause some problems. Yeah, I tell everybody that if you're talking about an SMA or a UHF or an F connector, if you couldn't do it with your finger, it wasn't tight enough. That, that, uh, yeah, I mean, that you should never be able to undo any one of those connectors with your fingers. Oh. I had a cable chewed up by a groundhog. That's that's never good for... Uh... Signal to noise ratio. <laughs> yeah, we have some experience with that. We had uh, trouble with Arctic foxes up in Greenland. And I've had trouble with squirrels here eating cable. I think what they go after is our the oils from our hand. So if you have a problem with that, keep your cable clean. And uh, you can bleach it after the fact. We've got a real problem in Arizona, especially in the warmer desert areas. 
of all sorts of little furry critters coming up and chewing on automotive, RV, and other uh, similar wiring. Yeah, they like PVC. It tastes sweet to them. Polyethylene should be better, but I can't say that I found an improvement. He's just trying to feed my woodchuck. Make sure he's happy. Uh, With pumpkins. I, I, I had someone recently that uh, did a, a review. I think it was, in, I just saw it in QST, in the product reviews of an antenna that the box that came on the antenna, the vertical, had an SO239 with the wrong serrations on the uh, on the SO239 socket, and it didn't match the PL259s that he had. So he could not get them to, to, to tighten up properly at all. He finally ended up having to change out the socket that was on the box. Uh, so Yeah, of course, SO239, yeah. UHF connectors will come apart with uh, temperature changes. I hate those things. Yeah. Um, another thing I've run into with uh, UHF connectors is there's a metric version. I've run into that uh, with Japanese components. Looks right, but it's not quite right. Threading is different. Those are the ones that go on about a third of the way than fine? Yes, right. I I have taken them out of I have I have I have run across Amphenol out of the original package that have the same problem. I, I don't know what the deal is. I mean it's it, it was it was an Amphenol package and now it that's interesting. Yeah, Amphenol's it was pretty old. I mean it, it didn't go on all the way. I mean yeah. it changed to a different Amphenol and it's fine. So one thing I've one thing I've actually done is gotten a uh uh, tap and uh, uh, threading uh, die set for that threading so I can clean up threads. Yeah, They're not I, expensive. Yeah, yeah. I think what the problem is is some of the authorities uh, when they are uh, rolled the the ID of the mail connector uh, ferrule is just a smidge too small. I think that's where the problem is. Mm -hmm. Another problem we've had here with lightning is the uh, Astron power supplies. The doggone uh, pulse gets into the the um, twelve volt line and fries the little seven twenty three regulator. Hmm. Yeah. Oh, the linears. Yeah. I've had the, um, there's a extra winding on the transformers um, for bootstrap voltage. I've had those fry. Ouch. Um, yeah, mentioning, uh, speaking of Astron, I've got a couple of SS30s that have died, and I can't figure out why they won't turn on. They the, pulse. Oh, it's the bootstrap capacitor if they're pulsing. There's a bootstrap capacitor on the startup. They, right. They probably, ran, they probably ran fine until they're turned off, then you try to turn them on again, then they fail. But that's yeah. pulsing is a giveaway. It's usually like a 22 or 4700 mic cap on there. But 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 generally, I have a friend who, who uh, uh, Robin, I know, who gets given all these power supplies that die for free, and he just spends, you know, it, by this time, he knows what the problem is, and he just replaces places, you know, right. bucks and capacitors, then 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 sells them for what he has into them, yeah. or gives it back to the other guy. Yeah, I've repaired a number of them, and I know some of the bootstrap circuits where to look, but these guys I haven't been able to figure out. And it's a, a new, it's an interesting circuit where the startup is actually a, um, uh. Oscill you know, it's a blocking oscillator winding. I, I, maybe that's not quite the right thing, but it's an extra winding on the transformer that starts it up. Uh, um, it creates an oscillator out of the uh, power stage, um, which then the uh, regulator takes over. But I, I, uh, yeah, I haven't figured out 
Okay, I'll take a look at. I, I just brought up the SS30 schematic and annoyingly none of the things are labeled, but uh, be interesting to figure out what chip they're using. It looks almost like the, the what is it, the 430? Oh, the chip? The chip's a TL 494. 494, okay, that's that's in everything. Oh, yes. Yeah, those are, yeah. As far as the linear supply is going, the, the two things that are having trouble, the, the first thing that I've always done with a linear supply is put another diode between back between the output and the input. That way you don't blow up the 723 because a really common thing to have happen was somebody would put a battery on the output of an Astron linear supply. But then when the power went out, they blow up the 723. But it's also bad in another way in case in the event that if you trip the crowbar with your battery across it, then other bad things happen. But 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 they never. I don't know. Most of they usually do not have a, a reverse polarity diode that essentially bridges the DC output to the bulk rectifier on the input. And 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 you need to add one of those. And then there's also a reset circuit. We have some on. We have some repeaters on mountains, and we've added the self-resetting circuits. So if they do crowbar from a nearby lightning strike, they reset themselves after 30 seconds, or at least they try to. Yeah. And I, I, we've since we did that, we've never had to go uh, have somebody go up there and just do the, you know, wait, wait the sixty seconds to turn them off and back on again. So, so whoever mentioned the Japanese uh, PL two fifty nine or SO two thirty nine connectors, I really appreciate that because I've had a cable here that I had bought from someplace that had connectors already on the cable. And I have, could never understand why that cable would not fully seat. Yep. You, know, you plug it in and you turn the thing only about one and a half turns and it just stops. Well, there's another problem I've run into and that's the length of the pin. Sometimes the pin bottoms out in the socket end and you can't get the shell to seat fully down. Yeah. The, the the other the other thing too is if you look carefully, some of those UHF female connectors, the SO two thirty nines, are very very slightly tapered. And they're very slightly tapered. Yeah, it's just it's got it can't be more than a fraction of a millimeter. But but I've run across that too. But you're right. The uh, I have some cable assemblies here that I've marked because there are certain items they will fit on and certain items they won't fit on. It's not the uh, years ago, I bought I bought a MFJ uh, antenna, and I and it was a UHF mount, but I use NMOs on my vehicle, and and so I tried screwing I tried screwing that on, and it would only go on about three turns and stop, yep. and what I found out was that it had machined to the wrong thread pitch. So it was you know you 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 hold up a UHF connector and the adapter, and they don't match. So I, I called MFJ and they sent me another one that was exactly like the previous one in that it didn't work. And so yeah. what I eventually did was I, I, I had a friend chuck it up in a lathe and we cut the middle sets of threads out so that they were back in phase again. So it, it actually worked fine, but it was a cheesy fix. But uh, that's the only time I've ever run across them where the threads were the actual wrong pitch, but it's usually the subtle tapering or the... Uh, or it's almost like the, when the when the ferrule was rolled, its uh, its ID was just a fraction of a millimeter too small. Right. Well, as I say, I, I actually ended up, I bought some connectors when I was over in Japan at one point. And these are the ones that ended up, I figured out it was a metric thread. It's just far enough off. Yeah. And in this case, it turns out that it's my main cable that goes up the tower to my antenna switch for my HF antenna. <laughs> of course it is. Yeah, of course it is. So, but but when I what I can tell, I mean, it's plugged into the back of the antenna tuner here, and I can tell that even though the the, the shell is tight, that I can wiggle the the body of the connector and pull it in and out a little bit. Exactly. So it is not absolutely seated. And if it can do that, there's no ground connection. 
well, or a well, it's very intermittent. Yes, flaky ground connection. And and I've had this problem for some period of time on the 80 and 40 meters where noise will just come and go and I can see it. And, and yeah, sometimes cool. if I start wiggling stuff around back behind the radio, I can see it do that. One but of, I can never figure out where it was coming from. One of the worst instances for us is that they, the DB224 four bay dipole antenna for two meters, which is our primary repeater antenna, it comes in two pieces. They put a UHF connector in between the two <laughs> and it works itself apart. Um, and so our coverage was kept changing. And, uh, you know, this was my theory, but you have to go up the tower to, to uh, fix it. And we can't climb the tower our antenna is on. So yeah. we changed out everything else until we changed out the antenna and it fixed it. We we have we actually put a Sinclair in instead of a DB products. We have, we have a local repeater that's the quote unquote Skywarn machine. And the two meter antenna, which is up 400 feet on this tower is a station master. Yep. If people are familiar with station master antennas, they do not have a DC ground. And so ironically, whenever it rains, there's so much rain static, we can't hear anything on the repeater. And this is our Skywarn repeater. <laughs> yeah, we've had our experiences with Sky ma uh, Station Masters. Yeah, I, I've been told that if we go up there and put up a folded dipole, that will fix the problem. Yeah, that's what we use. We've standardized to so that. They're shorted antennas. Uh, yeah. But as I say, don't use a DB products unless you change that center connect yeah. uh, connector because ah should be an N. The actual antenna connection is an N. Why they didn't put an N in the middle, I don't know. But of course, you have to be careful because the length is important. Otherwise, you'll put tilt in it. So as I say, uh, the Sinclair Sinclair makes a, the same antenna. A um, little more money, better quality. Are you talking about the 222? Two, two, two? uh, Sinclair? Uh, yeah. I can't remember the part number, think, but it, it's exactly the same as the DB224. Yeah. yeah, okay. Yeah, we, we, we use the folded dipoles exclusively because yeah. they're the ones that don't delete themselves when, the, when lightning visits them. <laughs> now, the odd thing about a station master while we're talking these antennas is that we had one that was actually commercial band. Um, 150 megahertz. Turned out it was an excellent antenna at UHF 440 as well. It's one of the best 440 antennas we had. We could diplex uh, our two uh, radios onto the one antenna. But that guy eventually, the weather got to it. Um, so, Rob, uh, this I'm looking at um, Glenn's site. Um, he hasn't done anything with um, in-the-air loops, it appears. He's got uh, on-the-ground loop. Yes, then, he's uh, been, yeah, he's been, he's the, uh, the he hasn't done in-the-air loops. I, I don't right. think he's, um, I mean, you could, you'd have to talk to Glenn about what, what he saw. I mean, he's been focused a lot on <clears throat> on trying to make sure things are uh, HOA friendly how how do you get uh, and uh, weather resistant so right. the designs he has uh the uh, the uh, as he say uh, loop on earth and beverage one right. is uh, what he uses up on his site yeah, so that's, on a WWV yeah it's like a it's a not a high impedance preamp but it's a 600 ohms preamp yeah for wave uh, antennas the, um, i think that yeah the, we, we've the done a lot dipole. of work with the low impedance uh you know presents 30 to 50 ohms to the to a loop um i'd like to characterize those a little bit better but that's what i have on uh grape two right now uh seems yeah, to have you, adequate you'd, sensitivity you'd have to, yeah yeah you'd have to 
I mean, I, to, you'd have to talk with Glenn. He's yep. he's got uh, he's invested a lot of time in in the Santana uh, investigations and uh, right. Well, I see. Yeah, you know, I got his site now. Okay, I and yeah, you can you can and yeah, send him an email. Studies. I'm sure he'd appreciate uh, interest. Uh, right. Uh, and Rob, you said that Glenn likes making these designs, but doesn't really have an interest in producing or. Uh... No, and he's uh, he'd be happy to have uh, Tapper take them on and offer them in the store if you want to do them. He he would he yeah, would be should. he would he would be very happy to have uh, Tapper offer any of these. Oh, that mm -hmm. actually brings up uh, another question I have, uh, Rob. Is what's the state of the uh, disciplined oscillator? Is that ready um, for prime time? Um, yeah. Well, uh, Glenn has. Uh, I don't. You know, I haven't heard much from John or, uh, Ackerman about yeah. that design in George. I know um, he's got two versions now. I mean, well, he, uh, well, Glenn has done a successor to his first design. Right. Uh, the, the successor uses a, a 5351C, which has seven outputs. And if you read into his uh, Glenn's discussion, he's also incorporated the... Uh, a continuing fraction algorithm, which allows uh, him to calculate to the microhertz uh, all seven outputs and uh, at most frequencies. So of course, there's some 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 uh, uh, relationships among the free output frequencies that introduce more phase noise than than. But for most of them. Uh, I, Glenn believes he's uh, is measured. He's doing better than the Bogner, um, right? Yeah. So he he, he does those games too. So, so um, I think that he is uh, this continuing fraction stuff, which I don't fully understand, but I think it uh, it 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 reduces it produces uh, uh, configuration setting register settings. That are uh, far more optimal than uh, the ones that Bogner uses. So, right. Is he able to get those fifty three fifty one Cs? You can get them. You can't get them uh, in China. They're yeah. they're they're and so you can't you can't order them from China. You have to order the board and put the fifty three fifty one C on for yourself, which is well beyond my my capabilities. And I have. I have a couple of his. I mean, I've got some of his two output ones, and that I that benefit from the same uh, uh, the the same continuing fraction accuracy, but I haven't had a chance to to work on them. I haven't I've I've had uh, I haven't had enough Bogners and such. I I have one of these in. Do I have? I can't. No, I don't. I, I have one of these in. Here I use in my shack, and I have a second one that is intended for KFS, but I haven't had time to go out there. So, yeah, I'm having trouble getting the uh, ones that we used in our AM Doppler receivers. So, looking for uh, something I can source. I think if you, uh, you should be able to order the the two output one on from uh, Glenn's. Uh, uh, website. I mean, you, 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 copy, you copy and paste that, and you order them from uh, JLPCB. You can get the right. ones with the fifty three fifty one uh, A on them, the two output version, and and Glenn fully supports that. So if you need a, uh, I don't know what they cost. The, I think the, the fifty three fifty one C Mauser has fifty thousand of them, and they're five and a half bucks in single quantity. Oh, good. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So they they're not. That's the. You, in the um what, what package is that qfn 20 so that's that's not even a that's not even a particularly nasty package to put on no well i mean it doesn't i'm not sure that the seven outputs you know that you still have the problem of, of ground loops so you know you, you have to do ground isolation um between to, yeah. you may have to do it between multiple receivers so yeah. if you don't need them the c is the one that will allow a uh, line input correct as opposed um, to crystal input yes i think that i think that yeah he he, he, it, he does allow external clock as a VGA. Yeah, it has, I, I just brought it up yeah it has both it has a matrix that'll select the source of a and b as either being oscillator or clock correct. so apparently you could have both if you really wanted 
<laughs> I'll take a look at his. Yeah, it... Boy, I can't believe 25 megahertz WWV is bombing in. Hasn't done that in months. Mm. Ten meters That's must good. be open too. I think I'm about to step aside here. If there's any other questions for me, I think I might say 73 as well. Oh. Classes start next week for me, <laughs> so it's yeah. gonna be it'll be fun next week because I'm teaching uh Tuesday Thursday classes, and the Tuesday class starts at 8:30 a.m. So it'll be fun going from this on Monday night to that Tuesday Ooh. morning. But yeah, it'll be it'll be a good time. It's a very uh, exciting semester. Classes started yeah. here this week. Yeah, Dartmouth starts late, but it's earlier than it used to be because we end uh, before Thanksgiving. But of course, we do trimesters or quarters, yeah. whichever way you want to look at it, rather than semesters. So before I go, I'll just say that I did put the um, link on the Hamsi website. So if you for the oh. uh, YouTube playlist. So Great. if you go to hamside.org slash hamside2024, you can now get to the YouTube playlist of all of the uh, conference Excellent. recordings. Uh, so that is there. And yeah, don't forget, um, it's not official yet, but a uh, pencil in March 14th and 15th for the Hamside workshop this year. So um, thank you very much, everyone. I will talk to you next week or uh, maybe before then. All right, 73. 73. Do you want me to leave the uh, meeting on anyone or uh, should I just close it down for everybody?